New, new in the sense of new to Rio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, he'll tell us about uh, active fluids and lazy swimmers. Oh, perfect. Okay, thanks, Paul. And, and thanks very much to, to Paul and Andre for inviting me uh, to IMPA, which I've, I've never been to IMPA nor to Rio. So uh, active fluids and lazy swimmers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, so uh, of course this is called waves three. And at, at the moment in my work, I'm not in kind of a waves mode. You know, a few years ago I was, I was with, very closely with June. Uh, I was working a lot on the flapping of flags, lots of waves there and things like this. Uh, but uh, let's not revisit past glories. So I'm going to tell you about uh, work I've been doing in the past few years instead. So uh, now we're going to move into a completely different regime than all the other talks that I've seen. There is no inertia. There is no length scale in this problem that's greater than, oh, a millimeter, something like this. So I'm going to be talking about problems where they uh, are fluids. They're full of things. They could be full of swimmers, like microscopic swimmers, like bacteria or some sort of primitive algae. Or they might be full of motor proteins that are grabbing onto things in the fluid and, and dragging them around. And uh, these kinds of problems show up in biology, but also in, in new areas of, of engineering and physics where you're, where you're thinking about systems that are strongly out of equilibrium. And uh, they're, they're, they're fun. So uh, this, um, is there a, a real, I hate laser pointers, but maybe there's a, that'll work. I don't know what this is, <laughs> but <laughs> mostly I'm going to be talking about this problem today, which has to do, yeah, 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 let me wash my hands first. So, but mostly I'm going to be talking about, about this problem, and, and this is from a, Ah, no, no, I, laser, I hate laser pointers. I don't, I don't like them. So the, so the thing about laser pointers is that only the person that's using it knows where it's pointing to. Right? So I find them very irritating. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. I'm not slow. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Just my swimmers are slow. Yeah. <laughs> that's I'll average out in the middle. Okay. So, uh, so I'll be talking about, about modeling and trying to model some experiments where, the, as I said, the fluid is full of swimmers, you can, but we're going to consider it from the point of view of being a continuous fluid. And so asking the question, what can I understand about these fluids by thinking of them as a complex fluid? which has active microstructure, which is creating stresses in the fluid and creating the flows that then move the microstructure. In addition, they have their, their own motion. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll skip this kind of slide, except to say there's lots of beautiful problems in, in, uh, in biology that obviously involve fluids, and typically those fluids are complex. They have microstructure, they're active, they're chewing up ATP, things are, things are happening all the time. So, but, uh, oops, did I go one step too far? Let's see what happens here. So, but this is the, real, this is the, the experiment from uh, Arizona uh, when uh, Ray Goldstein was there working very closely with John Kessler, and this is from, from uh, John Kessler's lab. And what this is showing you is the dynamics of tens of thousands of bacteria subtilis swimming around in a, in a droplet of fluid. And so, uh, as you can see, the system's small, 150 microns, and those little dots you see rolling around are individual bacteria. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that uh, John and, and, and Ray decide to do some very quantitative measurements. That's, that's one thing that Ray is very good at, and among other things. And, uh, and so what they did is, is PIV, so particle imaging velocimetry. I'm really trying not to walk around too much. So, uh, and so what you're seeing there is the velocity field that's, that's one recovers by tracking these swimmers as individuals and then reconstructing a velocity field in a slice. And so what you, what you see is that there are things like vortices, there are jets, and as you see from the movie above, this is all highly dynamical. It's not some sort of steady state structure. 
but everything's kind of, you know, roiling around, forming, collapsing, reforming. And more than that, uh, it, it, it kind of begs you to think of this as a continuum system because the sizes of the dynamical objects, the vortices and the jets, are about an order of magnitude greater than that of the individual swimmers. So maybe you're going to learn something by thinking about it that way. And the speeds are actually quite a bit larger, eight to ten times bigger than that of individual swimmers. So collectively, somehow, it must be the fluid, obviously, that if you're going to have a greater speed, it's, the fluid is what they're communicating through. So the fluid mechanics, at least, is, is in the game. And the question is, what gives rise to the patterns and the instability and so forth? There could be other things, such as some sort of oxygen taxis in the problem and these kinds of things. So this has become a very uh, popular system uh, to look at theoretically and uh, also experimentally. There's been an enormous amount of work since about 2000 when uh, Albert Liebschaber and Wu uh, looked at suspended films of bacteria and looked at the, at the dynamics of passive uh, polystyrene beads that were immersed within it. And there's all sorts of nice questions that arise. You know, what are the mechanisms, as I said, that give rise to these large-scale flows and patterns? What are the conditions under which they appear? Do they depend on things like system size, concentration? Do they depend upon the particular type of swimmer that you may have? There's, in the low Reynolds number world, there's many different swimming strategies that are employed. So, and so on. Okay. So, well, the other thing that should be said is, is that this is not just of biological importance. And so it's, there are some engineers that are now engineering devices that use bacteria in, in various ways. For example, by gluing their, uh, their heads to a, to a wall, and you can find you get a spontaneous uh, kind of directionality that arises of their flagella, and they'll form pumps, little microfluidic pumps. Or you can use them freely like this to mix fluids together. Obviously, this would be a nicely mixing uh, type of flow, and I'll say a bit more about that. So kind of the world of microfluidic technology. So let me say a little bit about swimming at low Reynolds number. Uh, so the, the, main, the main constraint at low Reynolds number is that you have no inertia. And the fact that you have no inertia means that you have, a, you have the Stokes equations, which means that you're dealing with flow reversibility. And so what that means is there's this famous scallop theorem due to Purcell, and Purcell tells us that if I have something like a scallop that's opening a shell and then closing it, then it's going through a time-reversible motion. And if it does that, it may displace itself forward on opening and displace itself backwards on closing and will not change position in the least over that cycle, at the end of that cycle. And that's because you can't squirt out. You know, if, you, if you're in a higher Reynolds number fluid, you, you do something like this. Quickly, you might squirt out a vortex ring and move yourself. But the type of flow that you get when you're opening is very different from that that you get when you're, when you're closing. And so you, inertia destroys reversibility. And that's why you have things like eagles, you know, that are basically just flapping their, their wings in a nicely reversible way, and they get around quite nicely. That does not happen in the low Reynolds number world. So you see things like pro always propagation of some sort of wave that has a non-reversible character. And so uh, sperm and uh, bacteria will use, you know, flagellar beating of some sort or rotation. Chlamydomonas is, is an analogy that also uses flagella to get around. Paramecia are covered with their ciliated organisms that have little beating hairs on their surface that go through a stroke and recovery that is non-reversible. And then something like C. elegans, a small millimeter-sized worm, just uses, you know, body plane undulations to move around. Now, very roughly, oh, the, other, the other constraint is, since you, is that since you have a no inertia, the total force and torque on the body at any instant in time, not in time average, but in any instant in time, has to be zero. So that's a, a very constraining fact and also very useful, actually, when you're, when you're constructing models. If you can, uh, those kind of algebraic constraints give you solvability conditions for things like velocities and rates of rotation. So what I'm going to talk about today are, are two very basic types of swimmers set in a very particular flow regime. Maybe we're going to think about swimmers like this, which are long rod-like things, because then in our numerical simulations, we get to use a reduction called, well, a slender body reduction for dealing with them, so we can deal with many swimmers very easily. And I'm going to be concentrating on, on two prototypes. One is a pusher particle, I'll call it, 
which is like a bacterium or a sperm. So it's going to have some sort of propulsive element at the rear, along the posterior, and it's pushing a payload forward. And uh, we also have things like polar particles, which, like this Chlamydomonas, are pulling themselves forward with a breast stroke from the front, and then they're dragging a payload. Now, why is that discriminant? Oh, let me, let me say one thing, too. I, I forgot to say a very crucial thing, is that uh, almost all the work that I'm going to be talking about today is, is done in collaboration with, with David Santian at Illinois, who was a few years ago uh, my postdoc at Courant, and he and I have continued a fruitful collaboration. So uh, this is all joint work with him, as well as with some ensuing postdocs, uh, Kayla Lushi and Christelle Hohenegger. Okay, so why does it make a difference whether you're talking about being a pusher or a puller? And this has to do with the types of flows that get induced around the body as it's, as it's locomoting. And so here is a simple model for a rod-like swimmer where we're solving for, for the dynamics of a Stokesian fluid, so just the Stokes equations. I'm not going to write them down and ruin uh, Alan's pristine board, everything off to the left, his old Stokes equations. I think we all know what they are. And so, uh, but here's the, here's the idea. Here, <laughs> I'm not going to point. This is it. So here's the posterior. What we're going to do is we're going to posit, we're going to prescribe a tangential stress, which is pushing fluid back along the posterior. So if, if you... You know, it's like, the, it's like having the cilia sitting on the back or, or it's some sort of coarse grain model for the action of, of, a, of a helical flagella that's turning. So you're just going to posit a tangential stress pushing things back, and that's going to push forward a payload upon which we have a no-slip condition. Now I know what this is. We have a no-slip condition. I'll, I'll dust myself off at the, at the end of this. <laughs> so, and so this is the type of flow that you get locally. You have flux of fluid along the posterior there, so you see fluid moving back. This rod is moving up. It's got a velocity that comes from that. And so it's dragging fluid with it as it moves up. And so you can see the fluid velocity on the anterior part is pointing up. So that creates an extensive flow along this swimmer. We're not going to consider this guy at all. It's a stealth swimmer. It has very rapid decay of, it, of its induced velocities. And there's a puller in this rod-like geometry. Now it's fluxing, it's moving in the same direction, moving up, but now it's fluxing fluid down, dragging the posterior, so that's moving up, and that creates a compressive flow along this filament. And so in either case, the, the filament is moving up with the same velocity, but the local flows that it induces are different. So you can already see right here that there might be some big difference in the way in which suspensions of pushers or pullers interact with each other. So... What David and I did is uh, wrote a fluid mechanics solver, and I'm not going to go into this a great deal, except that we're going to couple together several thousand of these swimmers together in, in a Stokesian fluid. The main thing you need to know about a Stokes fluid is that it's a linear partial differential equation, constant coefficient, and if you prescribe the forces on a boundary of, of an object in that fluid, it's solving a boundary value problem. It's a biharmonic problem, really, and you can get from that the velocity which will then move that object. Okay, so you have a bunch of things that are exerting forces. It's a bit more complicated than that because there's constraints. They have to remain rigid and so forth. That contributes to the force balance. But you have several thousand of these. They're all exerting this tangential stress, and then they're going to create a, a flow all together and move the whole set. So ah, there's the Stokes equations just to remind you. And this is a simulation from a, from a paper in 07 of 2,500 swimming pushers. And so what we were looking at at that point was uh, the stability of what you might call long-range orientational order, or could you have the existence of kind of flocks in low Reynolds number flows? Now, a reason to look at that is that there had been a phenomenological model that from uh, Ramaswamy and Simha in India, in which they predicted by kind of it's kind of a liquid crystal model to which they added some, some active stress components. They predicted that in low Reynolds number flow, you couldn't have oriented states, and we wanted to check to see whether that prediction was correct. So there was our simulation. Answer seems to be no, no oriented states. It moves immediately into kind of a roiling flow, which is very reminiscent, actually, of the experiments from Kessler and Goldstein, and since then others, 
So there are things like jets, there are vortices. If you reconstruct the background velocity field that they're all creating, you see the, the flow structure is very similar to those that you see in the experiments. Now, in terms of ordering, what you do see is that while you destroyed long-range orientational order, there's quite a lot of local order. There are little packs of rods over about a body length. They can be correlated in both direction and in orientation. They tend to move faster than, than single rods altogether. So you start to see a lot of elements in this very simple model of, of what you saw in the experiments. Yes? Periodic, triply. You're seeing it. Absolutely it does. But when you're doing particle simulations, you're, const you know, this is really kind of pushing how much you can do. If, if we move to a massively parallel system, this is, let me just say this. This is already using an optimal O of N scheme for doing the n-body problem. It's not fast multipole, but, but it's something like fast multipole. So uh, we're doing an optimal strategy for doing the interactions. Time stepping, there's no, there's no stability constraints at all because this is kind of a Lagrangian system. Uh, but, you know, it's expensive. You have big linear systems that you have to solve. You have to figure out how to precondition them, all this, all this kind of thing. So we'll be able to go up to about 10,000 rods, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But one of, the, one of the problems, of course, is that I'm about to develop a kinetic theory, and the kinetic theory is derived under all sorts of assumptions of separation of scale. So, for example, that the, the length of a, of a single rod is small relative to the macroscopic length of the system and of whatever flow structures that get produced and it's in a dilute limit and so forth, which is, is impossible to meet with our simulations. But nonetheless, it, it's pretty predictive on some things, and I'll talk about that. So the rods move like in two dimensions and three dimensions? This is three. Yeah, this is three. <laughs> Two and three dimensions, as you know, are very, very different in the Stokes equations. So uh, the Green's functions have different decay laws, things like this. So, oh, I, sh I should say that uh, here, the because these are force-free particles, then in the far field, the field looks like that induced by a force dipole, and so uh, and it decays like one over r squared. So that's the type of interactions that you have in this system is one over r squared interactions. Okay, so, so as I said, you, we see uh, persistence of short-range orientational order. Uh, we start to see some, in, in these, we started to see some differences uh, between pushers and pullers. So pushers, for example, led to an increase in the overall kind of mean suspension velocity, presumably because of the formation of these packs of rods, and I'll say more about number fluctuations and concentration that we see in this. And the types of flows that we saw develop were kind of on the system size, which is, which is again, consistent with what was found in these uh, experiments. So up on the upper right there is, is showing a background velocity field. And you can see that there's something like a jet running up the middle, there's vortices and so forth. Whenever, of course, that being said, whenever you're dealing with an incompressible fluid, there's only so many kind of flow structures that can appear in, in a kind of a dynamical setting. If you're going to have a jet, you kind of almost have to have vortices unless you're just going to have some planar layered things. So, that's what it is. Okay, so let me, because of Professor May's lecture yesterday when, when he went through this multi-scale uh, derivation, which I found quite pleasing to see, uh, I thought I would go through how, kind of in the complex fluids community, how one typically derives uh, continuum models for system like this. And a lot of this really goes back to work of, of Doy and Edwards, and you, you know, in, they have this great book on, on, on polymer dynamics. And this is really a variation on, the, on, on, the rod, on rod theory, dynamics of passive rod suspensions due to DOI, where we adapt it and, and change things appropriately. But let me just show you how, how it works. So now why do I want to do this? Well, okay, we have a particle simulator. It's a little tough to get analytical results out of a particle simulator. <laughs> it's a little hard to get analytical predictions You'd like to get them out of some sort of continuum models. You can go back and see what you find in, in your particle simulations. So it's, it's, a, it's a usual and important reason for doing these things. Yeah. No, we're not moving just dipoles. We're somewhere in between. We're solving the Stokes equations in the presence of slender rods. <laughs> 
where the, the local, but the, the, the main point is that um, the, so we're using slender body theory, right? And a single rod, the main point is a single rod, we use local slender body theory to deduce what its, its self deduce what its self-induced velocity is from its stress distribution and from the distribution of constraint forces on it. So the finite size only shows up in a log of an aspect ratio that comes from local slender body theory. But everything else is non-local fluid dynamics and we're solving the full Stokes equations. Okay. So here's a, here's a very, not, this is simpler than the one that, simpler than the model, slender body model we actually use in our simulations, but let me just walk you through this. So I'm just going to consider having a, having a very uh, simple rod-like swimmer where I have a constant, constant motive stress along that posterior part there. And then I have a payload up there, no slip on the payload. And if I have a, a surface stress that I'm prescribing, then I have to allow the possibility of a of slip velocity on that, on that part as well. Just imagine, if you, if you imagine all those ciliated things pushing, there's a little boundary layer, a little slip layer that forms. And so we have to allow the possibility of that. That becomes part of what we have to solve for. And so then I just write my rod in terms of its center of mass. S is arc length along the rod times its orientation vector. Okay, so it's just this geometric prescription of its center line. And then if I have such a rod and I know what the force per unit length that it's exerting upon the fluid is, which can be a combination of many things, it can, be, it can come from the motive stress as part of it. It has to have uh, a no penetration condition on it, which is going to determine in part normal stresses on the body. And also constraint stresses because we're requiring that this remains rigid as it's being rotated or moved by the velocity field induced by all the other particles. And so that's uh, local slender body theory, which just says, what's the velocity on the surface of the rod, which we're assuming doesn't change as mutually and just along the axis, relative to a background flow? Well, it's equal to some anisotropic drag tensor. So I have this I plus PP transpose acting on the force punit length. So that's classical slender body theory. And here, eta is essentially the viscosity divided through by a geometric coefficient that comes from the derivation of slender body theory that involves the log of the aspect ratio. So that's where you see the thickness, is only through this kind of weak log. So then you say, okay, what, I'm going to, what I want to solve for is the motion of such a rod in a background flow which is long relative to the size of the rod. And it's, it's going to, in the end, it's going to be the background flow that's induced by all the other rods. And so one thing, by solving that problem, you're saying immediately that the only way in which these rods communicate through each other is through macroscopic fluid stresses. So this is really a dilute theory where you're not allowing for local rod-rod interactions. You just have this kind of cloud of other rods far away enough that they're only inducing a, a linear background flow as far as you're concerned, which can be spatially inhomogeneous. Okay, and so we posit the existence of a background flow U, which we have to evaluate along X of S. We're assuming that the rod is, sh rod is short relative to that, so I can do a local expansion around the center of, center of mass. So there it is. And then I have that the, the force along the anterior has this slip uh, stress plus some piece I have to determine because it has to remain straight and so <coughs> forth. And then along the front, I just have what is essentially the no-slip condition. And then I have these conditions that the total force and the total torque on the rod have to be zero. You can solve that problem. And what you can determine is the motion of the center of mass. Well, what is it? It's moved with the background velocity, evaluated at the center of mass. And there's a calculable velocity which says, if just left by itself, this rod will push itself through the fluid because it has this motive stress. There's some velocity u naught, which involves the motive stress and some, some other uh, things that have to do with what's the size of the stress, what's the viscosity, what's the length, and so forth. And so there's some kappa to some geometric coefficient that multiplies the, the relevant physical uh, quantities. And then you also derive the rate of rotation of the rod through, through uh, having zero total torque. And that gives you the famous Jeffreys equation for rods, which just says you're rot if you rotate, you're rotated by background flow gradients. That's what rotates this small rod. And there's a constraint that that's a director vector, that P, so its norm is one. And so any time, so as I'm being rotated and stretched by the gradient of the fluid velocity acting on P there on the right, 
I have to pull off any changes in length in time. And that's what that I minus PP transpose filter is sitting up front. OK. Now imagine I have a suspension of such rods. They're all moving around in a linear gradient. And they're creating a stress, a volume average stress in the fluid by their motion. So then you say, OK, I want to figure out what their volume average stress is. So then I can determine what the background fluid velocity is that's moving the whole thing. And so then there are some very classical results that go back to Kirkwood and then uh, developed more fully in these particular types of problems by Batchelor in 1970. This says that if you're looking at the particular case of having N suspended rods, so I'm just giving you the, the special case, in the fluid, the volume average stress is that quantity. It's a sum of integrals over the center, uh, center line uh, arc length, and it's a position times the transpose of that force. Now, it seems a little weird, right, to see a bare position showing up in that formula. Why should, why should a, a stress depend on a bare position? But it really doesn't, because that force has zero average. You do an integration by parts, you kill off the position. OK, so it doesn't really depend on position. It really just depends on orientation, which makes more sense. So for a single rod, you do that calculation. And what you find is you end up with two terms. The first term there, kappa 1 L cubed, that's the surface stress, G parallel. And that's PP transpose, just this rank 1 tensor having to do with orientation. That's the classical kind of dipole stress induced by a rod moving in a fluid. And here, it's the stress that's induced by a single rod propelling itself through the fluid. That's the stress. And then this is the stress that arises because it's being rotated by the background fluid flow, and it has to remain straight. And so that's the stress, which is like a constraint stress that says, I'm going to remain straight despite the background fluid flow. It turns out that if you're working in, in a, a dilute limit, that's a higher order term. So we're going to drop it. And so I just end up getting this guy, single rod extra stress. Is that quantity some stresslet parameter sigma naught times this rank one tensor? Then I'm going to average over some sort of control volume to get the bulk stress that comes out of that mass of rods. And I end up with, with formulas like this, with the main point being that you get an extra stress from rods that are pushers and pullers that comes with a different sign, depending on whether you're a pusher or a puller. So that's interesting. And it all has to do with the, the signs of those local flows that they're, that they're developing around them. So there you are. OK. How do you pick the control <laughs> We're not picking anything in our numerical simulation. All we're doing is taking a bunch of rods and putting them into a periodic box. When the control volumes are picked in the derivation by satisfying, you know, by fiat, the various uh, separation of scales requirements. <coughs> Which are all violated by the simulations that we're able to do. Just say it straight, but it's okay. Okay, so then what you do is you're going to say, I have a lot of rods. And in any one of these control volumes, I have enough rods to replace that discrete sum for the extra stress by, by some sort of, of distributional average. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to evolve through a Fokker-Planck equation. I'm going to evolve a distribution function whose independent variables are center of mass position and orientation of the rod. So those will be the confirmation variables of the system. So there's my Fokker-Planck equation. And I'm going to stick that x dot and p dot in there as confirmational fluxes that sit and are evolving the, the, the probability distribution. So there they are. Interesting question. So the only place in which collision terms really come in is it arises from an observation that we make in the numerical simulations. That uh, as a function of the, of the effective volume fraction of swimmers, we find that the rotational, and the rotational uh, diffusion of the rods goes up linearly with volume concentration, which is consistent with pair interactions having some sort of pair interaction that they're, that they're going through. And then, the orienta and then we find uh, that the translational diffusion varies inversely with volume concentration, which is consistent with having the, the rotational distribution or, or, or diffusion driving the, the translational diffusion. So that's the collision piece, if you like. Right. I'll come back to that point a little bit later. 
that part could be done in a more interesting way, I think. This is just kind of the first pass at the whole thing. So, so there you are. Uh, you have your Fokker-Planck equation. Now I say, okay, I'm going to use that active stress that I derived on the previous page, that volume average stress, to drive the background fluid velocity through the Stokes equations. There it is. And there, now I write it as a distributional average. And I, I pulled off just a trace piece to, to give it zero trace because fluid mechanics people like to see tensors with zero, zero trace. So, uh, but the, the thing is, I rescale the system. I'm not going to go into the, into the rescaling, though it's interesting. Actually, you rescale on an effective volume fraction to get, it, to get a new length, and it turns out that leaves you with this stresslet depending only on geometric parameters, that thing that sits in front of the extra stress. Yeah, just for fun. We allow the possibility of having some diffusion. And when we're actually, and we're not going to be, yes. Yes, I forgot, I forgot to say that, yeah. And so in the particle flux, we're going to allow the possibility of having diffusive terms. They could, they could be coming from some modeling of these pair interactions, or they could be because you have some sort of inherent stochasticity in, in the way some little swimmer gets around, which is certainly true. Okay. Now, this system is, is pretty interesting, if I may say so. And so it, it turns out to have a, a nice energy-like quantity, which we call configurational entropy. And so uh, if psi naught, let psi naught be just the constant that, that corresponds to having a uniform isotropic suspension. In this case, it turns out to be 1 over 4 pi, the area of the unit sphere. And so if I, if I write down this kind of normalized entropy in terms of my distribution function, since psi is a conserved field, that turns out to be positive, and it will only reach its minimum of zero when it's in the uniform isotropic state. And so this entropy measures the size of fluctuations in various quantities. It could be in concentration. It could be in orientation relative to this uniform isotropic state. And so what you find very nicely, you play with your equations, is that the time rate of change of this energy-like quantity comes with two terms on the right-hand side. One is something that arises from the diffusive processes that you're going to insert by fiat into the system, if you choose to, which pull down fluctuations or try to bring the entropy down, down to its minimum of zero. But there's another term which is proportional to the rate of viscous dissipation in the system. So this rate of viscous dissipation is balanced by the rate of work being done on the system by the swimmers moving through it. And what happens is that that stresslet, that sigma naught, which had a sign, which is now renamed as alpha under the non-dimensionalization, sits in front of that term, which is strictly positive. And so for pullers, which is the case, well, where they're pulling from the front, uh, where alpha is positive, I meant to say that's also the case that, that arises in Doi's rod theory. When you're looking at that term in Doi rod theory, then that alpha is strictly positive. What that means is the fluctuations will, will dissipate monotonically in those types of suspensions. It's just, a, just an identity, so there's no linearization or anything like that. So you have this kind of nonlinear prediction. No matter what your initial conditions are, fluctuations are just going to dissipate. Pushers, on the other hand, that term can then be, then be positive, and it can drive growth of fluctuations, which then get balanced by the diffusive processes in your system. So that's the interesting case. Linear theory is consistent with that. So uh, if you do linearization around the uniform isotropic suspension, this is what the growth rate curve looks like as a function of uh, spatial wave number. You have a long wave instability if you start increasing your system size from somewhere over here. And then there's a bifurcation into two modes where the fastest growing growth rate is at k equals zero. And if in the case of, of pullers, that whole thing just flips down and becomes negative. Now, let, let me just say one thing. Think about the particles for a moment. Here I am, I have a pusher, right? And so I have a bunch of them moving around. Now, if I change the sign of the stress on, on this particle, it instantly becomes a, a puller, right? That's all I need to do. So there's a reversibility, and it will just re, the whole suspension will just retrace its path. So there's a reversibility in this system, and it also reverses the stability properties. Of course, that kind of single or rather, a bunch of particles swimming 
that's a completely deterministic system. There's no diffusion, no real diffusion in it at all. And so it's a, it's a completely reversible system. And so then you, will, you would expect that you're just going to change the signs of, of all the, if you have instability in one direction and it's a first order type, then you're going to have stability in the other. Actually, in that way, it's, it's, a, it's a lot like the, the Healy-Shaw problem without surface tension, for those of you that have ever worked on that problem. Growth of a bubble. Okay, so here are some uh, nonlinear simulations that David and I did. These are 2D because we, that's like three degrees of freedom, two positions and an angle, so it's fairly expensive. And we start off near isotropy for, for a pusher system that should have several unstable modes in it, in that length scale. And we're pushing around. The pushers we're representing by kind of pseudoparticles because this is a kinetic theory, so we, we kind of concoct some sort of artificial swimmer to represent how the, how the swimmers would be moving around. So it starts off near isotropy. The flow organizes itself. And you see these nice vortices. You see jets. And again, like the particle simulations and like the experiments, is very dynamical. There they are kind of rotating around, lining up and colliding at these extensional hyperbolic points. You see concentration bands that will form and then become unstable and reform and so forth. So there's lots of kind of fluctuation type phenomena in these systems. And if I take this system, and now I, I showed you what the swimmers look like as they're moving around. What happens to, a, this is just very pretty. I told you that these would be nice mixing, nice mixing systems. I just want to illustrate that for you. And so what I'm showing you here is that same simulation, same parameters, where now I'm just pushing around a, a, a dye field by the background flow velocity. So it starts off with a sinu, sinusoidal distribution between blue and red. And so what you see is kind of a stretch fold dynamics that comes out of this. And actually, it arises because in those simulations I just showed you, there's constant formation of concentration bands that become unstable. They can kind of become transversely unstable, and then they form in the other direction. So they're constantly stretching and folding the system. And the consequence is that if you want to mix a fluid, this is maybe a good way. Very unstable internally driven systems. OK. Now, another thing, and this is from work with Crystal Hohenegger. She it turned out that the linear stability problem is, is, is a little complicated. So we looked at that by itself. And, uh, but one result that came from my work with, with Christelle is that we got a very nice uh, stability threshold constraint on these, on these systems for pushers. Pullers are always stable. Okay, and I'll talk a bit more about pusher and pullers from the point of view of particle simulations in a second. But what you find is that if you do have this observed scaling that, the, it, from, that we see from the particle simulations up into what's called the semi-dilute regime, I'm not going to define that for you, but I can if you want me to, then uh, what, we, what we found in our particle simulations is that the rotational diffusion increased linearly, the translational diffusion decreased inversely with that, and so it turned out that when you put that into the way we scaled the equations in the kinetic theory, then you got this very nice sharp stability constraint that just said that nu tilde is the effective volume fraction of swimmers in the system. So here's a swimmer rotated around so you get the volume of, this, of the sphere that it occupies, that it interacts with. Multiply that by the number of swimmers, divide by the total volume, that's nu tilde. Okay? So, and so what it says is that the effective volume fraction times a normalized system size, normalized by the swimmer size, is bigger than some geometric parameter that has to do with the geometry of the swimmers and how big the mode of stress is and so forth. And so then what, that's, what that is saying is that if you fix the system size, you can up the concentration and you'll cross into having some sort of stability. So below this cutoff, you are stable in the isotropic state. You're above it, you become unstable, or if you increase the system size for a fixed volume concentration. So it's a nice, nice prediction. And it's consistent, at least, with some uh, experiments that, that came from Ray Goldstein's uh, lab at Princeton. And so what we decided to do recently was to go back and start to look at some of the predictions of kinetic theory in our rod suspensions, in our, in our particle uh, simulator. 
And so what I'm going to show you is uh, four simulations, three of which are pusher simulations and one of which is pullers, as I have a fixed system size of 10 cubed, okay? And I'm just going to increase the number of swimmers within, within, that, within that volume. So here's the very dilute. So this effective volume fraction is a tenth. We start off with an isotropic arrangement, uniform and isotropic arrangement. You know, you, you have to do statistical analyses on these to decide whether there's any sort of correlations that are coming out of it, but the answer is no. You can do all that. If I increase the effective volume fraction to 0.5, then you start to see things like some more local alignment of rods. You start to see some regions of clarified fluid. Maybe you see something that looks like some sort of structure coming out of it. Let me show you what polar particles look like at, at high volume fraction of 1. There they are. They start off uniform and isotropic. You don't see anything that looks like local correlation of rod swimming or orientation. And you can do tests against Poissonian distributions of, of their center of mass positions and in interrogation volumes, and it looks Poissonian. It really looks just like a random distribution all the time. In fact, it becomes kind of more random than random. There's some kind of interesting aspects to it. And here's a bunch of pushers at higher volume concentration. And then you really see it's, it's a very, very different beast than the case of, of, of pullers. Now they're all pushers. You can see it's a much faster moving flow. You see lots of packs that have locally aligned swimmers that are moving along. Those packs have no fixed membership. They disintegrate, they form, they lose members, they gain members. It's all very dynamical. Okay, so then you can start to ask things like number density fluctuations. Do you see things like concentration fluctuations in, in these systems that are not in accordance with just fluctuations that arise from randomness? So what you can do is you can, you can test that against having a, a Poisson distribution, just throwing down by randomly a bunch of particle positions. And what you find is that, is that polar suspensions always line up very well with just having a uniform isotropic suspension. Here it's just particle location, but the same is true of orientation. On the other hand, in, in cases of pusher uh, suspensions, you start to get fat tails. So they start to spread, which is telling that you're getting blobs of, of swimmers that are kind of forming in this that are not predicted by just having a uniform isotropic suspension. And so this is what, in the parlance of kind of particle dynamics, is called giant number fluctuations. Sounds, sounds very grand. And so what we find is we do indeed, I, I suppress that slide for some reason, we do indeed get uh, giant number fluctuations that have an exponent of growth, kind of a power law behavior associated with the growth of the standard deviation, uh, which is about 0.6 rather than 0.5 that you get for Poissonian, and is below that that was actually predicted by a simple theory of, of uh, super, of uh, too, many, too many Indian names on my tongue, Ramaswamy and Simha, rather than Subramanian and Koch. Okay, and other things that we find in these simulations is that as in the experiments, we find that we have uh, velocities that are actually five to eight times the speed of, of single swimmer velocities when we're, when we're at the higher concentrations. And so what's being uh, shown here is as a function of particle velocity for different effective volume fractions, what is the local, or what is the local concentration? Around, around a rod. And so then you see that as the velocity increases, those giant number fluctuations are associated with having higher local concentration. And if you also then plot that velocity instead against local orientation around rods, then you find that you also tend to be more oriented in these, in these uh, fluctu high, higher fluctuation density regions as well. So you're forming these kind of, as I said, you can see by eye, these packs of rods that are swimming around, they have higher concentration and higher velocity. Okay, and let me just show you this mixing picture again. Now, instead of for the kinetic theory, this is for the, uh, these rod suspensions. And you see that if I look at small for pushers, which are stable at low volume fractions, what you find 
is at low volume fractions, you can see these little traces as pushers are dragging fluid around, colored fluid around across the system in kind of an isotropic way. And so that will lead to a diffusion of that dye field, but which is very slow. It will go up linearly with volume concentration, but it has a very small slope. You see the same thing in, in, in pullers, but of course, here's high volume fraction of pullers, and there's a lot more of them, but they remain in this uniform isotropic state. So you see essentially the same dynamics, but speeded up and a little more fine grained. But you see, you can remain, you keep this, this structure for a long time of having these two bands of red and blue. On the other hand, as we see in our simulations and as we predict from the kinetic theory, that if you go into systems which have higher volume fraction, then you have large scale flows. And that's what this baby does. So this is a slice through a 3D fluid. That's why it does not look like an incompressible flow in the plane because there's divergences in the plane. And it just, like the kinetic theory, it, it, it mixes uh, very finely. There are departures that we do see from the predictions of kinetic theory. We do see correlations in kind of sub-threshold behavior, which we think have to do with the fact that we have finite number effects in our simulations and lack of separation of scale. But nonetheless, uh, the kinetic theory does a reasonable job in kind of predicting uh, transitions in this problem. And here's a, a sense of where the transition is occurring. If you take those simulations I, that I just showed you, there's something that's called a multi-scale mixing norm, which is just measuring how many times the, the fluid has been kind of folded or the dye field has been folded by the background fluid flow. So the more it's been folded, the smaller this norm is. It's kind of an h to the minus one-half norm. And so what you see is that for uh, pushers, then there's this bifurcation at around nu equals 0.5 where then you start to get very rapid mixing of the fluid. And uh, pullers, on the other hand, remain uh, nice and flat. You can blow that little bit up for pullers, and you'll see you have a very slow linear increase with, with volume concentration. And uh, that's also seen in diffusion of passive tracers, same, same type of thing. So we predict that around nu equals 0.5 for a system size of 10, that we get a uh, bifurcation. The kinetic theory predicts 0.9 for nu instead of 0.5, ah, factor of two. But what we also do see is that if we fix then the volume concentration and increase the system size, then at about at the right point, namely nu times L has to be a fixed value, then we get the bifurcation again by fixing volume fraction and increasing system size. So kind of in its structure, it's, it's consistent with the theory. Okay. now. I have, I, sh I should probably stop there, right? That's about 45 minutes. Where's my chairman? Paul? I'm, I'm going to show one movie. That's all I'm going to do. I'm going to show two movies. So, first movie, this is, would be the second part of the talk if I had 15 more minutes, which I'm not going to take. But, uh, this has to do with another type of active fluid, which is uh, the cytoplasm of a single cell C. elegans embryo, which is uh, trying to get itself to the stage where the cell can undergo cell mitosis and then cell division. And the crucial elements in this, again, are rod-like objects. They're actually microtubules that are growing into the cytoplasm from the male nucleus, which wants to meet with the female and then do its thing. That are, that are, have upon it walking motor proteins that are exerting pulling forces and pushing forces on the fluid simultaneously and hence moving the, a, a nucleus around. And so this movie here, the upper left one, this is about a 70 micron size system along the long axis. That's the male pronucleus on the right. This is from Fabio Piano's lab at, at NYU. Female comes over and meets it. It rotates into what's called proper position. The mitotic spindle forms, tears apart the genetic material, the cell divides, and then it does it again and again and again until the C. elegans has 959 cells, which is not a power of two. So a big part of that dynamics now, the female's moving towards a very rapid, <laughs> I like this. Everybody should use this. <laughs> so, is that 
there's motions along the, what's called the cortex, along the membrane. They're pulling the female towards it. But the male is also moving under its own force, which kind of takes over the whole system once it meets the female. And that's associated with those bright rays that you see, which are microtubules that are, that are tagged with uh, green fluorescent protein. And so uh, we've constructed a, a, a model of this system, and this is with Tamar uh, Shinar, who's another uh, great postdoc of mine at, uh, at NYU, who's now going to UC Riverside, where we model uh, a lot of the fluid dynamical processes that are associated with kind of microtubule motor protein motion of a pronucleus across the cell. And so I'll just show you, I'll just show you a movie, and I'll stop there. I'll show you two movies. <laughs> it's always two. <laughs> So here's a fluid mechanical uh, simulation of what's called, now we're going to call it the pronuclear pair, moving into the center, being pulled by these tubes that are sticking off into the fluid and interacting with motor proteins in it, and rotating, mostly because of nice geometric force constraints on the whole system. It's really all geometry driven. And rotating, rotating into what is called proper position, one part of the dynamics you can see, there's a lot of streaming along the fluid, of the fluid along these uh, microtubules. And so cytopl this is related to what's called cytoplasmic streaming. It has to do with the fact that the motor proteins are attached to payloads that are dragging fluid along with it as they're, as they're marching towards the nucleus. And so we capture all that in this simulation. So, so there, it, it turns out that microtubules are very dynamical objects in themselves. They undergo constant polymerization and depolymerization. That's a process called dynamical instability, which is very well studied. And so we have a model for dynamic instability that we put into, <laughs> into the fluid mechanical system. And so this is a paper that's about to appear in PNAS on this, and you can read it next week. But uh, let me just show you one last movie showing this dynamics again. This is a movie I showed at the Grant Christmas lecture this year to great applause. You don't have to applaud. <laughs> but uh, this was just, this was at the end when we, when it was time to go upstairs and, and, and start having a party. And uh, so Tamar cooked up this nice simulation again. It's the same one as before, but she did a reverse mapping on the color field. So it ended there. Anyway, and I'll stop there too.